I like to go to bed early. And with that, we can dismiss and go take naps. Uh, on, on Saturday nights, I, I try to go to bed even earlier than normal, sometimes unreasonably early. Uh, so a Saturday afternoon hits, and it's getting close to dinner time, and I, I try to make sure all the stuff is done so that whenever I'm finished and I decide it's time to lay down and get into bed, whatever, everything's done. There's no more, well, we have to do this, this, and this. So last night, last night, the dogs were walked. I volunteered to walk the dogs. The doors got locked, and this is important because Amy and I both have a little bit of OCD, and if I lock the doors and she asks me and I say, yes, I lock the doors, she usually goes and checks anyway. And if she locks the doors and I ask, did you lock the doors, I usually go and check anyway. We got the kitchen straightened up. The kids volunteered to do that with their attitudes. It was great. And all the things were taken care of, and I was, I was settled in bed, watching TV, sigh of relief. It was like 7 o'clock. Isn't that nice? We're sitting there, and, and, and Amy, we're talking. Usually we, we have the pause button because we don't watch actual TV. We have Netflix, so we can pause it all we want to. So we pause it, and, and somehow our conversation got around to chocolate chip pancakes. You can't start a conversation about chocolate chip pancakes and not end up with chocolate chip pancakes. And, and that's not a normal thing at our house, but sometime later this week we had gotten a nice gluten-free chocolate chip pancake batter mix, uh, or pancake batter mix, and we had some chocolate chips that were safe for Paige with her, all of our food allergy checklists, and so I volunteered to go make some chocolate chip pancakes. Now, I knew that not only would I get chocolate chip pancakes if I volunteered to do this, but I would also get those all very valuable brownie points with Amy. So I go and I, I make the chocolate chip pancakes, and I bring them back in, and I walk into the bedroom, and in the spot that, that I had been looking forward to so long all day, my spot, I had the pillows all set right and everything, there was a little boy. And, and next to him, there was a, a lump in the blankets that was about the size of a certain little blonde girl. So naturally, I quickly, because it's bedtime, I now have chocolate chip pancakes and bedtime, get out. And, and we, we shut and lock our bedroom door because uh, one time it happened where there was a little face that woke me up right here, and so now we lock the door. Uh, so I sent the kids away and reclaimed my spot quick and easy, and then I got the look. The look that indicates I had done something wrong. In this case, it was a dad fail. I found out the kids had come in with questions about Methuselah in the Bible. I'm a preacher. I'm supposed to stop everything and answer my kids' Bible questions with no problem. But Crawford, Crawford's very intrigued by that verse in Genesis where God says um, his days shall be 120 years. And, and he's even more intrigued by the first five chapters of Genesis where people lived to be 7, 8, 969 years old. I got too focused on me, on what I wanted, on this is the only thing in my sights because of the blinders was bedtime, and in this case, bedtime got a bonus of chocolate chip pancakes. I was more concerned about going to sleep than about my kids coming in and asking me questions about the Bible. Questions that, you know, there's, that's not the, the kind of legacy I want to leave with my kids where I don't want them to remember me as a selfish, cranky old dad who isn't to be disturbed except for during the five-minute time frame when I allow it during the day. We do this in life, though, don't we? We get focused on our own plans on our own things, we put on those blinders, we forget about who God has called us to be, and I start thinking that I am the whole body. But we've been talking about how we're one body with many parts, and, and I know that I'm just one small part of this body with many parts. I lose sight of God's calling, and I think that um, my inheritance is in him. I forget that my inheritance is in him. I focus on, on petty things and selfish things, like going to sleep instead of taking five minutes to talk to the kids about how old Methuselah was. Today we're getting into the first half or so of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're going to be focusing on some um, petty things. Here is what Paul gets on to them about, on some, some selfish things that the Corinthians are, are focusing on, on setting a very poor example for the world around them. And they have this trouble, and we have the same trouble because too often we forget who we are and who we're supposed to be. So let's pray, and then we'll jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> God, thank you so much for this example we can see of the church in Corinth, 
the, the lessons that Paul works to teach them, that we know we can apply those to our own lives, God. And I pray that we would hear Paul's words of encouragement and, and his, his words of kind of chastisement, and we could learn those lessons as well, God, and save ourselves some time. Help us to do a good job at being who you've called us to be and focusing on the right things. Thank you so much for Jesus, and it's in his name I pray. Amen. Now, we're going to start off with the first six verses of 1 Corinthians 6. Does any one of you, when he's a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? So if you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church? I say this to your shame. It is so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brethren. But brother, brother, brother goes to law with brother, and that before unbelievers. Now the Greek world, and Corinth was no exception, was full of people suing each other. The world hasn't really changed much, has it? The Jews were not supposed to take their issues to the heathen courts, though those heathen Greek worldly courts. They were supposed to handle things themselves. They were supposed to handle everything internally. And we see these courts throughout the New Testament. We hear about the Sanhedrin, that Jewish council, the, the courts of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the high priests and the scribes and all those guys. But this kind of attitude that Israel had, that, that Corinth had, this constant bickering and the intent to not only settle things legally, but to destroy someone who wronged you, to take them to court, take everything they own, and leave them with nothing. Especially if I'm a Christian and the person I'm pursuing this uh, litigation with is also a believer, someone who's supposed to be a brother or a sister, this kind of attitude gives the world around us the wrong kind of view about who we are. What's the point of that anyway? You know, Paul wrote this letter and he says that the saints will judge the world. We can read through the Bible over and over and over where the believers are called the saints. You are the church. You are saints. And Paul says the saints will judge the world. How are we to judge the world if we can't handle our own problems? In Daniel 7, 22, a few verses about the saints taking charge. We read, until the ancient of days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Now remember, that's us. We are the saints. We are the church. Daniel 7, 27, then the sovereignty the dominion and the greatest of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. Revelation 2.26, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end to him, I will give authority over the nations. Revelation 3.21, he who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne. So if the saints, us, if we are to judge the world, why can't we handle the little problems within the church? And if we look around at the church, our church, other churches, the church across the world, we see a lot of little problems that we're not doing a very good job of handling. We're so caught up, caught up on these, these little things. And, and little things, they might be a big deal to us, but compared to the kingdom of heaven, compared to these eternity issues that we should be helping people take care of, all the things we fight and bicker about in the churches are pretty petty. But if we can't handle the little things of the church, then maybe we aren't ready to judge the world. We aren't being who we should be. We aren't doing a good job at being the body, one body with many parts. And maybe we've got some growing up to do and some searching of the scriptures and some evaluation of ourselves to do. It's interesting here, the, these people that Paul's getting on to in Corinth that are pursuing litigation, they were among the wealthy there in the church. They had property, which was a very small percentage of the people in the church. Uh, at least they were wealthy by human worldly standards. They were people who, who had stuff, who had things, pursuing people who didn't have much, people who didn't have the things. They were claiming that someone had wronged them, and they wanted to be compensated. These people Paul's getting onto about these lawsuits are people who felt like someone had, had done them wrong, and they wanted to be treated fairly, and they deserved that. They wanted to be indemnified. I've mentioned before I worked in insurance for a while through college, and that was a big thing with insurance is indemnification. And that's just getting back to where you were before whatever happened to you happened. And that's not always what we go for. We don't want to just get me back to where I was. If you wronged me, I want to come out ahead and I want you to come out below. 
these people in Corinth, and we can see reflection in our own churches today, were so consumed by the materialistic wealth, the status that they had in the church and the community that they lost sight of who God had chosen them to be. They forgot what their real inheritance was. Sometimes we, we cling to our things. We want to have that financial legacy to, to leave the full of earthly physical treasures to leave behind for our families. And it's okay to have toys. It's okay to have the stuff and the things, but is that our real treasure? Is that the inheritance that we work towards for our entire lives? When did we get confused about that inheritance? Now, verse 5 here in our section, I say this to your shame, is that verse. And that's a contrast. A few weeks ago, we read chapter 4, verse 4. He says, I did not write these things to shame you. But now, chapter 4, Paul's not trying to shame them. But chapter 6, Paul's ready. Paul's ready to shame them, and their behavior deserves it. We've forgotten what legacy we're called to leave. We've forgotten what our real inheritance is, and therefore we're working towards and valuing all the wrong things. This passage is about lawsuits in the church, but more than that, it's about a poor attitude. It's about allowing yourself to become so selfish that you are seeking to destroy another believer. About letting your possessions dictate your behavior, about letting your reputation dictate your behavior, about thinking that you are more important than you really are. Let's read 7 and 8 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> it says, Actually then, it is already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? On the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud. You do this even to your brethren. I'm going to read that again. This is a pretty, pretty important section of our passage here, and Paul says it pretty plainly and pretty clearly. Actually, then, it is already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? On the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud. You do this even to your brethren. I'm going to sum this up for you. If this is you, if you have lawsuits and litigations, if you are trying to destroy a brother or sister, Paul says you are already defeated, and shame on you. The world is watching us, and if we are attacking one another, how can we go out to the world and be a good steward of the good news if all we're doing are bad things to the people who are supposed to be closest to us? We talked last week about how we are absolutely responsible to hold one another accountable as believers as parts of the body, and that doesn't just mean South Lake Christian Church. That means the church worldwide. This is all believers. We hold each other accountable. Everyone who calls himself a believer is held to a standard, and it's up to us. If you can't hold your brother and sister accountable to what the Bible calls us to without a lawsuit, without letting the devil use you to destroy another believer and do harm to the church and our witness in the world, to ruin your testimony and your influence, maybe Maybe you're not as strong of a Christian as you'd like to think you were. Maybe you've forgotten where your real inheritance comes from. Now, why, why would Paul get on to these Corinthian Christians about this? Why would they, and why do believers today pursue the courts and feel justified and righteous as if that's what they deserve? Why pursue litigation? Is it to get rich? Is it because we think we were treated unfairly? Maybe someone disregarded your, your feelings and, and hurt you. We work so hard our entire lives, to what end? Is the purpose of life to get everything that we want? To get all the toys, all the technology? Is the purpose of our life to get everything, all the comforts, fill up the 401k and the IRA and the bank accounts and have the gold bars hidden in the backyard somewhere? Is our legacy to be how much we have left over to set up our kids and our grandkids? Do we work hard our entire life for that, for stuff and things? Is that the inheritance that we are most concerned about? Compared to, like I said earlier, kingdom things, eternity things, getting the gospel out to people, these are, these are petty things. My big issues, my greatest concerns in life, things that I get worked up about compared to matters of the kingdom of God, they're pretty petty. Last night, 
I got a little irritable when I came back with my chocolate chip pancakes and, and, and found Crawford in my spot, Paige under the blankets, which means my pillows and my blankets weren't the way that I wanted them. Unfortunately, that's not an isolated event. I make bad decisions a lot, and hopefully I'm not the only one in here who can truthfully admit that we make bad decisions. I get too focused on me. I get my blinders on and have what I want to happen ready to happen, and nothing else matters. This is the way it's going to be. I forget that I'm setting an example for them. And if I won't stop to take time to answer a question about the Bible for them, then who will? If we won't take time to answer a question with our life, with our example for the non-believers in the world, we're too busy fighting amongst ourselves, then who will? I forget that the kids are watching me and learning how to be an adult. I forget that the world is watching me and learning how to be a mature believer. They're learning from our example how to live for Christ. If I focus on my now more than on their forever, that's a fail. Let's finish out the next couple verses, 9, 10, and 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Being a Christian, being a believer is not a free pass. If, if you believe and you were baptized and then you live recklessly in all the worst ways, if you live selfishly, if you live just for you, you're wrong. And Paul gives this list here and makes it pretty clear with a bold statement that that kind of lifestyle, the selfishness, if that's you, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, inheriting the kingdom of God, we have to understand what that means. Inheriting the kingdom of God is not like when your grandmother passes away and you inherit some money or a house or some land, because that goes away. Inheriting the kingdom of God is forever. That's not just the rest of your life. That's the rest of eternity, and that's hard for us to grasp. But inheriting the kingdom of God is forever. Compared to the things that we have on earth, compared to our fleeting desires or feelings, feeling like someone's upset us or done us wrong, the kingdom of God is forever, and you're better than that. Paul reminds the Corinthian Christians that they were washed, that they were sanctified, that they were justified in the name of Jesus. So why would you spend your time worshiping something else and pursuing the stuff and things and putting down the people around you if you are washed, sanctified, justified in the name of Jesus? Those petty little things that consume us should fade away. Why would we spend our time chasing after fellow believers with the intent to harm them? There are right now in the world kids that are dying. Their families have no hope and they need you. There are right now in the world Orphans who need families, kids who need love. There are people living in our world who are homeless, with very little to their name, if anything. There are people in our world who are hopeless. Maybe people who have surrounded themselves with stuff and things, but they don't know why and they don't know what happens next. They don't have that hope. There are people in the world who are lost, and yet some of us, some of us who profess Jesus as our Savior and, and claim to live for him, and we've dedicated our waking moments to harming other believers, arguing amongst ourselves about some pretty petty things, spending time judging one another about things that don't matter. Why? We put more effort and more resources behind doctrine and theology than we do caring for the fatherless, giving to the needy, sharing the truth of the gospel with folks who don't know what Jesus died for or that he died for. For them, if that's how we behave, what inheritance do we think we have coming to us? We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be set apart. We're supposed to be made holy. I know life is hard and people can be mean, but if we're pursuing hurting other people, pursuing only the stuff and the things, what inheritance are we pursuing? Not one that's going to last. Let me just tell you what your inheritance is again. Your inheritance 
is heaven forever. Again, in Revelation 21, 23, it says the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. That's our inheritance. There's no sun in heaven because we bask in God's glory. That's what we're pursuing with everything we are. And compared to that, nothing else matters. It's tough when I've wrapped up my day and the kids come in and they sit in my spot when I just want to close my eyes. When we're busy with life and someone else needs us and we want to just tell them, I don't have time right now. I'm tired. You don't understand how busy I am. But the decisions that we make in those moments reflect what we value most as our inheritance. Today, as Bill mentioned, we have a decision song coming up. And each, each day we have to make a decision. When we come to church, we leave. Each morning we get up, we have a decision to make. And my prayer this week as we leave this building, as we go out to be the church in our communities, my prayer is that you remember what you're really working towards. That you remember the legacy that you're supposed to be leaving and that your life reflects the inheritance that you hope to be receiving. Maybe, maybe today your decision is just to stop and, and say a prayer, and you need to stay seated when we stand and sing this song and, and pray and talk to God about that, about where your focus is and about what inheritance your life looks like you're pursuing so you can make some changes. That's a good decision to make today. Feel free to stay seated or come up here and let's pray together because I told you my story about chocolate chip pancakes and kids, and I need some prayer for that as well. We all make bad decisions, and we all pursue the wrong things at times. Maybe your decision today is you're hearing about this, about what Jesus did. You're hearing about this inheritance, and that's something that you, you're beginning to understand. And your decision today is to accept that, maybe for the first time, that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that what he did on the cross when he died was for you, and you want to repent of everything before now and live a new life and follow him in baptism with that repentance and live for him. Today's a great day to make that decision, to come down and let us know so we can celebrate that new life with you. And maybe today your decision is just to, to get some accountability, to do a better job at being a believer, at being a follower, a better job at pursuing the right inheritance. As a body of believers, one body, many parts, we need you to commit to us so we can be better as well because we need your help to be the best church we can be, just like you need our help to be the best you you can be. Either way, we all have a decision to make, and I pray that you won't just go. Check it off your list so that we can keep things the same because we can all do a better job today than we did yesterday, and hopefully tomorrow we'll do a better job than we did today. As we pray, think about what inheritance your life is pursuing. Let's bow. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that we have this, this book, this Bible, this, this story of, of what you've done for us, God, and I pray that we would be able to look through its pages and and never live the same. I pray that our life would reflect that we're pursuing an inheritance for eternity with you. God, I pray that our decisions would show that we, we long to, to bask in your glory. God, help each one of us to make better decisions with our time and with our pursuits. Help us to not seek to, to harm one another, God, but to set a good example for the world in loving one another, in caring for one another, and reaching out to be good stewards of your good news to the world around us. Thank you so much for Jesus. And it's in his name I pray.